Hello, my name is Rob Anderson, and today I'm happy to share some thoughts on model evaluation in this amazing course that town has organized. So what I'm going to try to do is give an overview to model evaluation, uh, setting up ideas that will be followed up in subsequent lectures by other people, especially um, the relation of model evaluation uh, to theory. And so my lab is interested in spatial and temporal patterns of environmental suitability and their ecological, evolutionary, and practical consequences. And in doing so, uh, we've been involved in many aspects of developing niche modeling applications. So what I'm going to do is not as much a traditional lecture, um, but go over things that I think are important that will be followed um, by other talks uh, later in the series and gives you examples um, through studies uh, that my lab has done. So I'll do this through an intro and then key principles um, backed up by these studies and then some resources uh, that I think are helpful. So let's start with the introduction. So as you've seen in many other uh, lectures for this course, we're using two kinds of uh, input data and there are many algorithms available to somehow form uh, a model of the species niche or at least its environmental associations that then can be applied to geography to identify the areas that are suitable for species. These models can be applied in other places and other times, um, which lead to many of their applications in conservation, invasive species, zoonotic diseases, and climate change as an uh, umbrella issue that applies to many of these uses. So in this time of a global pandemic, many of us have diseases on our mind. And of course, Town has uh, written an entire book uh, about this, but I also like to draw your attention to a recent review entry by one of my current graduate students, Erica Johnson. So with this in mind, I think uh, one of the things I have said in many ways over many years is this really is not a very easy uh, thing to do, um, to model um, these kinds of niches and distributions. And part of that uh, is because of the data that we have. Um, and part of it is that in addition to using software tools, there's a lot of thinking um, that's involved. And it, it wasn't always clear um, in the literature or in courses that people uh, began many, many years ago you know, what all of the major issues were. Fortunately, now we have three amazing books um, that I use. I used all three of these the last time I taught uh, a seminar, a grad seminar in mapping uh, species distributions and modeling their niches. And um, these are great resources. Also, uh, I was involved in a big project um, that was a, an effort towards reaching some consensus, which was extremely difficult, and some structure in how we think about the major decisions um, that need uh, to be made uh, in this kind of modeling and the levels of quality um, that are aspirational um, versus cutting edge uh, versus the minimal necessary uh, for applied uses. So I think this is a really important uh, project um, that I would suggest that people take a look at these publications, especially as a supplemental, and, um, and use this to guide your thinking and hopefully the community improving uh, on this structure as the field advances. So let's go uh, to the key principles that I want to introduce today. So there's five, uh, model complexity and overfitting, the need for separate evaluation data, unequal weight for different kinds of errors, and issues of performance versus significance, and finally, ecological realism in the models that we make. So let's start with model complexity. And so I'd like um, to show a few ideas uh, from a project um, by an honors undergraduate of mine, Maria Shagluvideva. So thinking very generally about overfitting, let's just think about two variables and get on the same page about what we want to avoid. So if these were data points, which and it show relationship um, between these two variables, we could have a model that's extremely complex and fits those points perfectly. However, when confronted with independent evaluation data, that model might not do very good. And part of that is that fit to the noise um, in that particular original sample, or even uh, perhaps um, there was a fit to a bias present in the first sample. In this case, a much simpler model shown by the red line would have had higher predictivity of the green points, which were not part 
of the information available uh, when we made the model. So we want to avoid models that are overfit to the training data. So this leads to model complexity, uh, which has various aspects. And one is, of course, the number of variables um, that are input into the model. Um, but also on the first issue I have here is the feature classes. This is an example from Xant, what are term feature classes. And the general idea here is the flexibility of the shape um, of the response that is allowed uh, to the algorithm. And in Xant, you have linear, quadratic, product, hinge, and threshold features. Another is the issue, general issue of penalties for increased complexity. And in Maxent, this is via regularization. Um, most people using Maxent, uh, including uh, our lab now, are generally varying a multiplier, which is applied to all of the particular individual um, beta coefficients for different feature classes. And sometimes, um, People need to be more careful in how they report what they're what they're working on uh, when they when they vary the regularization multiplier. And this controls the strength of a penalty for additional parameters and for higher weights of those parameters. So the stronger the penalty, um, then you have the tendency for simpler and simpler models. And what is really important here is that analogs exist for this kind of penalty in almost every, every other technique. And this is something that I think was uh, the most important take home I, uh, I had as I was using the Gisan et al. book um, in my most recent grad class, um, that issues of model tuning uh, were covered uh, over and over again. And the vocabulary used for particular techniques varies, um, but it's essentially um, the same kind of um, a process in order to determine trade-offs between complexity and um, generality. So let's move to the idea of separate evaluation data. And this is um, a paper that came out by Alex Radosavlovich, who is a master's student in my lab. So it used to be um, that we often uh, made random partitions of our data. And over and over, over the past 20 odd years, you know, we in the general, we, I, and many others have realized that many of the things we used to do were really not very good. Um, and this is a, one of the things we've realized. So here we have a fourth of the localities in um, black, which were withheld for evaluating the model, and they were randomly chosen out of the overall pool, and the rest of the localities in white uh, were used to make the model. However, um, random partitions generally overestimate uh, evaluation statistics, and they cannot detect any overfitting to sampling bias, which is preserved in both of the data sets. So in order to get data that are more independent, um, there are th some things you can do. And this is probably one of the largest problems uh, with the kind of data that we use that we're never really gonna have a very, uh, a truly independent data set. But one thing we can do is we can divide our records um, in space. Um, and so one example is a geographically partitioned data set into four groups, K equals four for K full cross validation. And what Alex did here is divide things into bins of approximately equal sample sizes of localities. So withholding the bin on the left and making the model with the other three, and then doing this three more times. And another issue is for most of the models um, that people are making, where do you take your background or pseudo absence sample? So in the, the middle case here under G for, geographically structured partitions, we are taking occurrence records from the right-hand side, uh, you know, the three-fourths of the study region on the right, but not on the left. And if we also take background information from there, as indicated in the middle one, we are really leading to a false negative signal that by providing background data, we say, oh, this is a, you know, available to the species. Um, let's see if it inhabits uh, any of those areas but we're artifactually removing the, the positive records. Um, so that's not fair. That's um, going to bias our, our model. So what is more appropriate is to mask out uh, the region corresponding to the withheld occurrence records, which is what is shown in the bottom panel. And so 
the take home message of this study, uh, as far as results, is, is shown here, and in this case with the mission rate, that overfitting decreases with higher regularization rates. So high omission indicates overfitting, this is omission on test uh, data, and that uh, decreases dramatically uh, as you increase the penalty uh, for complexity. Here are some examples with very, very low levels uh, of regularization. We had a really uh, tight, tight model around uh, occurrence localities in some Piedmont areas that are especially heavily sampled. Um, and then when we had very high levels of protection, the overall prediction was extremely blurry and not providing as much discrimination as was optimal. And um, the best models uh, we got, according to various criteria, were um, at this intermediate level, in this case, twice the default uh, setting of the strength of regularization. And this matched quite a lot of what we knew about the ecological uh, association of the species uh, with various climatic factors. So let's move on now to the third major point, uh, which is unequal weight for different kinds of errors. And um, the paper where I first was involved in pointing out these kinds of issues uh, was actually from my dissertation in postdoc era. So you'll hear very soon uh, quite a bit more about several measures of performance uh, in Towns talk. However, what I wanted to set up here is just a little bit of really basic information to make uh, other points. So an emission rate is also called the false negative rate, and this is one minus sensitivity uh, if that is um, the, the terminology that you're used to using. So this error rate is the proportion of localities falling outside the prediction. So we would like this error rate to be low. The other principal uh, error rate is what has been termed a commission error rate, which is also termed false positive rate or one minus specificity. And this is the proportion of absence or background localities falling inside the prediction, and we want this to be low. However, uh, the problems comes when we don't actually have absence localities, uh, but we have a background sample. So this background sample includes many pixels uh, that probably uh, really are within the areas that are suitable for our species. Uh, we just don't have enough biological sampling um, to, to show that, so, so we don't have um, enough positive records, but also the whole idea of background samples is that we're including information from the whole region, um, not only the, the areas that are unsuitable or absent, but also um, those that are present. So this, this does not provide an unbiased estimate of true commission. It's artifactually inflated in these cases. And so this creates uh, problems. So we need to be careful not to penalize a model that predicts suitable places without any records. And this problem continues uh, because many measures of performance reflect a combination of both omission and commission errors. And the most commonly used one, of course, is AOC, AUC, the area under the curve of the receiver operating characteristic plot. And this reflects overall discriminatory ability of the model, um, taking into account uh, both omission and commission. And we want a high value uh, for this. However, because it includes um, elements of both of those issues, um, whenever we are calculating commission based on background or student pseudo absence uh, information, we have the problem that this AUC itself uh, is also biased. So we need here to be careful uh, not to penalize the model that predicts suitable places without any records. And this leads to the, the conclusion in the field that AUC can be used under certain circumstances, for example, in comparisons of the same study um, or the same species in the same study region, maybe with different parameterizations uh, or perhaps different um, input um, variables. However, it should not be used as a direct comparison across different species in the same study region or uh, across study regions. And this leads um, to problems in interpretation, not only of performance, um, but also uh, issues of significance as well. And then in these cases where we don't have um, 
we don't really have absence data um, to calculate this statistic or, or others like it, then um, what we get out of the statistic can be a relative measure within a particular study system, but not an absolute one uh, that can be interpreted uh, for other systems. So that leads me uh, to performance versus significance. And what I'm going to show you, <coughs> excuse me, is a little bit from a really interesting project uh, led by a CUNY PhD student in a different lab. And Quentin took a, uh, took a course with me and I was on his um, advisory committee. So he ended up uh, working out a modification of previous null um, models uh, for, um, for assessing performance and significance. And I'll walk you through the um, the flow chart here. So there's a lot going on, but let's start by looking at the blue parts. So we have real uh, occurrence records and real environmental data. So we are using um, a set of calibration records um, to make the model and we've already uh, withheld some uh, for evaluation. We'll see that in a minute. So we take those two um, data sources, we make a real niche model in the blue rectangle. And, uh, oh, you know, hopefully through some um, process of model tuning uh, to assess the best settings and model complexity. And then we assess measures of performance like emission rate or AAUC based on the real uh, withheld occurrence records, okay? So we get um, measures of performance. And that is, is what is, you know, typically uh, done um, in, in the field that we're used to doing this kind of thing, right? Now, let's go down to the bottom, the red part. So we're gonna do something very, very similar, except instead of real uh, calibration occurrences, we're going to calibrate the model using random occurrences from exactly the same uh, study region. So we use the real environmental data, so the uh, background sample, and uh, random uh, occurrence records. So we build a niche model there um, using the same process as we did with the real data. And then we're gonna calculate measures of performance uh, there in the right part of the small box. And we're using that, um, in order to do that, we use the real withheld evaluation occurrences, um, the same ones that we use to evaluate um, the real model. So all, the model down at the bottom, um, we take that measure of performance and we um, we start to accumulate those. And we do this process at the bottom many, many times, a hundred times, a thousand times, um, some very large number. And over on the right, then we, uh, we get a distribution of mm, a values uh, of those uh, measures of performance. So say this could be AUC values, and you do that say a hundred times, you get a hundred um, values, and you make a distribution of those. And that is our null distribution um, for that uh, data set you know, in that exact study region with those exact environmental variables. And these, you accumulate these uh, when you have enough to think that you have a smooth enough uh, distribution there, then you can take your real value performance, uh, which is the blue line here, figure out where it is in this distribution and determine whether it falls beyond the 95th percentile of that null distribution. And in this case, we are only looking at one tail because we're only interested in things that are better than random. We're not interested in things that are uh, worse than random. So some of the results uh, of that study with the monk parakeet, uh, for example, here in with AUC, almost all of the real models, which are indicated by the black circle, um, ended up being significantly better than random. And these are various um, different study regions used uh, for the testing. However, uh, for emission rate, and very few of them uh, ended up being significant. And it was a rather humbling experience because we compared with the test um, that we used in my dissertation, um, which it turns out uh, violates assumptions that, that we weren't even thinking about uh, back in the time. Uh, but now, um, we can assess emission rate via these null model uh, approaches. Now let's move on to the last point, ecological realism. And here, um, this is a project that two students of mine worked on with a postdoc who was in my lab. So, question, 
can we really ask correlative techniques to identify environmental drivers? Well, probably not. And I do hope that we can use them to at least uh, generate hypotheses of drivers that could be, at least in theory, uh, tested with experiments. And in some cases, for example, with plants and uh, with insects, where you can do common garden experiments, and we really can uh, test for these drivers that are identified through niche models. However, even though we can't do uh, definitive identification of environmental drivers, I also ask, can we afford to ignore ecological realism uh, with these models? And I think the answer is no. I think that uh, we are better off using what information we do know about the species to see if our models are at least ecologically plausible. So this particular study was with shrews of a species group um, in Eastern Mexico that Lusser has worked on quite a lot and has a pretty good understanding of. So this species uh, is found in montane areas um, that are not too dry and not too hot, so definitely not found in lowland areas today, but also not too cold. So you, there are areas in the mountains that are too cold uh, for this species uh, from what we understand. For example, uh, the highest uh, peak in the mountain, Orizaba or Sitlatepetl. So above about 3,200 meters, um, the species is not found. We also know that it, at the last glacial maximum, their vegetational shifts uh, relative to today in cloud forests uh, were approximately 1,000 meters lower. So we have the reasonable explanation um, that the species would not have been found then uh, above approximately 2,200 meters. So there are two models that I'm going to show here. And um, what's important is not the details. What is important is two models that we're going to compare and we're going to see which is ecologically realistic. One was made with all 19 variables um, available in WorldClim, and one was just with four, in this case chosen um, to represent ecological extremes that we thought uh, were more likely to be limiting the species distribution. What's important is that we have a comparison and we're looking at the species response curves. And the first model, um, well, so I'm showing two variables um, related to temperature um, that were uh, the most important uh, for, for the model, right? So the first one shows us that we have a flat response that goes down at really high temperatures. And that makes sense. The species is not found in the coastal lowlands. However, it does not make sense on the left part of the response curve, where it, the suitability is just as good at the coldest, coldest, coldest areas. However, the model at the bottom makes much more sense where we have low, uh, low suitability at the highest temperatures and low su suitability at the lowest temperatures. And this makes sense because we don't have shrews in the coldest places. For example, uh, the snow caps on the top of Sitlaltepetl. The biggest problem, however, is that the first model will transfer poorly to colder times and colder places um, because it doesn't have any decrease in suitability at those coldest values. And those may be very few pixels right now. However, in the past, for example, at the last glacial maximum, it could have been a lot uh, larger portion of the species distribution. And let's see these results in geography. So this is a moderate zoom uh, to an important part of the, of the study region. The top model is more contiguous, whereas the bottom one is tighter and has greater discrimination. Um, which in general uh, is probably also good. But the bottom model is much better in that it excludes the highest elevations um, in contrast to the top one. So let's zoom in again here in the bottom. And that's what we get. And this can, kind of looks like a donut hole. The middle of that circle where we have low suitability is the, is Sitlatepetl, the highest parts. And we know even today that these, um, these areas are too cold for the species. So this model made much more sense. When we uh, apply this to reconstructed conditions at the last glacial maximum, the top model is not very uh, realistic in the highland areas because there are some very high areas with uh, fairly high levels of suitability. Um, the one in the bottom actually makes uh, really good sense and it ex excludes uh, the, the higher elevations above approximately 2200 meters or so. Um, so this really does match much better um, our ecological expectations based on what we know uh, about the species. All right, so those are five key principles that I hope you think about 
and I think you will see uh, again in the coming lectures on evaluations. One thing I would like to mention, for example, if you look at all of the issues covered in um, the Araujo et al. standards paper, is that many of the issues that I'll talk about, or I have talked about, and we will have other people talking about evaluation, are actually covered there in the model building, um, because there's this tight relationship between what you need to do in building the model and how you find out whether you did it uh, reasonably in the evaluation side. So mm -hmm. these two areas are so tightly tied together um, that when you go and look at, I think there are 15 issues overall, um, look in both of those sections uh, when you're thinking about setting up your, um, your analyses and when you're thinking about how you're going to evaluate them. So moving on to resources, there are many algorithms out there, um, and that's good news. Um, but one of the common ones, uh, of course, is Maxent. And I was involved in a project not too long ago where we were finally able to make this open source and it's now hosted at the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation at the American Museum. There's a new output format um, with interesting links to population uh, biology theory and um, an R package now, Maxnet, uh, which Shirley uh, Corey Miro mentioned uh, in his earlier uh, lectures on Maxent. Also, I'd like to uh, remind you about ENM eval, which I believe you've heard about earlier in the course also, uh, or you will later, uh, led by Bob Muscarella, who was a student at Columbia University, and I was on his committee. And one of the things um, he did was collaborate with my lab in making this package, which automates a lot of things that had been extremely tedious to do. Um, many of the things I've talked about today. What's really exciting is now Jamie Cass, a former student of mine, is leading um, a team, which includes many of these same people, in order to update e and eval, and it's uh, really pretty far along. And one of the most exciting things is that it's now completely restructured to make it much, much easier to add other algorithms. For example, uh, we're working to add boosted regression trees at this point. Um, it's also integrating uh, the Bull et al. Uh, randomization approach, which is exciting to me. Moving on to it, other software needs. Um, a few years ago, in a perspective piece that I was asked to do, I described how the field needed software that achieved an appropriate balance between automation and supervision automating repetitive aspects, but forcing the user to make critical biological and conceptual distinctions, decisions. And that applies um, directly to code-based research, but it also applies to, um, to GUI software. So a few years ago, inspired by the E.B. Nielsen challenge of GBIF, um, several of us put together the first um, versions of a software called Wallace EchoMod. And this is now documented by a software node, and I hope uh, some of you are using it. And a couple of weeks ago, you heard uh, from two of the developers uh, about this software. I want to point out here that it does a lot of the things that I talked about uh, today um, that can be pretty, um, pretty laborious uh, and tedious uh, to do if you're trying to do this from scratch uh, with the GIS. One of this is spatial partitioning, in including uh, the masking uh, out of areas that um, correspond uh, to the withheld bin, uh, which used to be a real pain. You can also vary the complexity uh, of Maxent models and sort um, your results by various evaluation metrics to identify the candidate models uh, that appear to be performing the best. And uh, it has a convenient way to view the response curves. Uh, so the first uh, release, full release of Wallace is out um, with, um, with uh, several small extensions and bug fixes. Um, under ongoing NSF funding, we're working with external partners to add new modules. And part of this has included uh, re-engineering the software to make it much easier to add new modules. Um, and so that's been a really interesting and exciting process. I'd like to thank uh, all of the external partners that we've worked with so far. We also are involved uh, in an ongoing NASA project led by Mary Blair at the American Museum to develop new packages, uh, new R packages related to post-processing uh, model output. And this will add them to Wallace and interface with Biomodelos, which is a really wonderful program um, being developed by the Institute Humboldt in, in Colombia. And it's especially um, geared uh, 
at engaging taxonomic experts to vet and critique the input data for various species, and then um, critique and then certify uh, the, um, the models uh, that come out at the end, um, certifying them in the sense that they are, they are plausible uh, given what the, um, the expert knows uh, about that species. And my lab is uh, using uh, all of these uh, resources for a project on Sky Island biogeography in Eastern Mexico, where we're studying uh, issues related to climate and land use change, biogeography, and mammal, parasite, and pathogen uh, communities uh, with three Mexican collaborators and um, at this point, four of my students. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to show some of the results um, of this project uh, in other series or other courses um, that uh, town organizes. So I'd like to thank uh, you guys uh, for your time. I hope this is uh, going to prove useful and for town for organizing this amazing uh, set of lectures, far beyond what I ever would have imagined uh, until you put it together. Um, so enjoy the rest of the course and I look forward to meeting many of you uh, in the future.